Chapter One of Bert Wilson at the Wheel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Mack, Tucson, Arizona. Bert Wilson at the Wheel by J. W. Duffeld. Chapter One The Red Scout. What dandy luck! It's too good to be true. Who'd ever thought we'd have the luck to get it here? It can't be true. I shan't believe till it gets here. Anyway, it is true, and won't we have the niffiest time ever? Well, you might as well sit down, Bob. Running around like a hen with her head cut off won't make it come any sooner. Oh, how's a fellow to sit still when a thing like that's on the way? I wonder how long we'll have to wait. What can be keeping him? A score of voices, talking singly, two together, all together, woke the woodland echoes, silent through the long winter and tardy spring, gone at last. Summer had come, and with it the annual encampment of a score or more of manly, healthy youngsters, overflowing with animal spirits and vitality. For several years past, substantially the same group, under the supervision of a Mr. Hollis, a gentleman of sterling character and considerable means, had gone into camp together for two or three weeks of the heated season. Brimming over with life, the boys always made the camp a lively place. But this summer, a new and enveloping excitement seemed to have taken possession of everyone, and now all were plunged into a discussion of the cause of the hullabaloo, the voices rising higher and higher as each one sought to make himself heard above the rest. Turning a bend in the road that brought the camp into view, Mr. Hollis, as he witnessed the excited gestures of the boys and heard the volume of sound caused by every enthusiast trying to talk at once, instinctively quickened his pace, for it almost seemed as though a serious altercation were in progress. But as he came near enough to distinguish words and heard six cylinders, 48 horsepower, chrome nickel steel, wheelbase 112 inches, diamond tires, autometer, safety treads, grip treads, he realized that nothing more serious was going on than a discussion of the relative merits of automobiles and their fittings. No wonder there was gesturing and loud talking. What boy would not rise to the topmost heights of enthusiasm at the thought of an automobile in which he was to have a personal interest? Such a delight had come to the camp, and since the announcement in the morning that on account of the long trips that the summer's plans would make necessary, the boys would be allowed an automobile for their own exclusive use. Nothing else had been thought or talked about and each eager boy was impatiently awaiting the return of Mr. Hollis to learn the make and all other details of that most wonderful car. Now, as he came into camp, the boys crowded around him, and the wood rang with cheers as he told them the car would arrive the following morning. A volley of questions overwhelmed him. How large is it? What speed? What color is it? How many of us can ride in it at a time? Question followed question in quick succession, until Mr. Hollis put his hands over his ears and, refusing to answer any more, proposed dinner as a means of quelling the noise. The boys could scarcely have told of what their dinner consisted that night, so great was their excitement. All were glad to turn in early as the surest way to bring the morning and the longed-for car. A full hour earlier than usual, the lights were out, and silence settled over the camp, broken only by nature's mysterious night sounds. A belated rabbit, homeward bound, keeping ceaseless vigil with round, bright eyes, encouraged by the unusual quiet, crept close to the door of the mess tent, and snatching a stray cracker from the grass, scurried joyfully away. At the distant, menacing to wit to woo of the night owl, the birds stirred uneasily and nestled closer under the cover of sheltering leaves. 
the quiet hours crept on until at last morning dawned and gave promise of a glorious day frank edgewood was the first to open sleepy eyes and seeing a few clouds not yet dissipated by the early sun woke the camp with the dismal wail fellows it's going to rain put him out smother him duck him in the brook came in a chorus and frank taking to his heels dropped the flap of his tent with not a moment to spare run early and avoid the rush sang out tom henderson to pass he had such scanty room the descending grazed his plume chanted dick trent let's forgive and forget said ben cooper be glad we let you live frank bob ward chimed in and so the culprit reassured ventured out to breakfast again the all-absorbing topic was renewed two vital questions claiming them what should they name their auto who would be able to run it the first was easy enough for almost from the first they had decided the color permitting to call it the red scout the second was not so easy for mr hollis must be assured for the sake of general safety that the driver should be fully capable if only bert wilson were there the question would be answered for capable bert in new york had studied the mechanism of automobiles and grown very proficient in handling them but they were not sure he would be able to be in camp with them this year expressions of regret were heard on all sides for Bert had a very warm place in their hearts. His splendid qualities had easily made him their natural leader, and his absence was far more keenly felt than any other fellow in camp would have been. Still, Bert not being there, they must choose someone else. So Mr. Hollis called for volunteers. Several answered, but their qualifications were rather doubtful until Bob Ward said that he had a lot of experience in driving his uncle's machine and felt very sure he could handle it. So it was decided that the next day Bob should take them on their first trip, which would be in search of a new campsite, the old one proving too small for this year's requirements. While the question as to who should be chosen to drive the automobile was being decided, Sam Fielding and Philip Strong, Two of the younger boys had placed a long plank over a big rock which rested under the shade of a low-branched tree and thus improvised a capital seesaw. When the question was settled, there was a general movement among the boys and one of them, thoughtless of consequences, jumped upon Sam's end of the board. This added weight gave the other end a sudden jerk upward and in a twinkling Philip was tossed into the boughs of a tree, where his foot, catching in a forked branch, he hung suspended, head downward, his jacket falling about and covering his head and face, while he yelled like a Comanche Indian. In an instant the entire camp was aroused, and Phil was quickly extricated from his uncomfortable position. At the sight of his astonished face, the whole camp went into paroxysms of mirth, while peal after peal of laughter made the woods echo again. Even Phil, right side up with care, could not resist the contagion and joined in the merriment. It was many minutes before a normal condition of things was re-established, but at last the boys fell to discussing the proposed change of camp. It's a shame we have to change, said Charlie Adams. I don't believe we'll have such bully times in the new camp as we have had here. Oh, I don't know, said Tom cheerily. We'll have the dandiest fun, hunting new caves and things. It will at least have the charm of novelty, joined in Dick Trent. Dick was eighteen and sometimes used words and phrases so ponderous as to give him added dignity in the eyes of the other fellows. Things will be altogether different this summer, he went on. Having the auto will make a great change. Well, we're going to have a great time today anyway, said Bob Ward. Mr. Hollis says we are to make a flying trip in the new machine, and I will have a chance, while the man who brings it here, to study handling the car. As Bob finished speaking, a distant but distinct honk-honk sent each boy tearing down the road, 
where in due time a great red glistening car came up the turnpike like a gleaming streak of light and with a graceful curve to the side of the road stopped the car their car the red scout had come End of chapter 1chapter two of bert wilson at the wheel this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by tom mack tucson arizona bert wilson at the wheel by j w duffeld chapter two the flying auto a group of the campers stood regarding the big red touring car rather dubiously. The fact is, Bob Ward was saying as he meditatively chewed a long piece of grass, you can never tell when the fool thing is going to go back on you. I used to drive my uncle's car a good deal, but I never could go very far without some part of the machinery breaking down. Uncle Jack said I was a Jonah, and I guess I was, because he could run the pesky thing all over the country if I wasn't with him, and it would go like a bird. One day I ran it into a fence and nearly got killed, so I took the hint and haven't fooled with one since. But we ought to make a try at locating a site for the new camp, Frank Edgewood objected. We volunteered and we'll be the laughing stock of the whole camp if we don't succeed besides breaking our word to Mr. Hollis. Yes, I don't know why you said you could do it if you're going to get cold feet at the last minute, said Jim. I haven't got cold feet, Bob defended hotly. Then virtuously, it isn't because of my own danger that I hesitate, but I don't like to drag you fellows into it with me. If you don't mind breaking your own neck, you needn't worry about ours, said Dave Ferris. We'll stay here while you take a little spin across the country, grinning wickedly. Of course, if you should find a good camp location in the meantime, you could claim all the glory. This last condescendingly. Before Bob had time to retort a cry of Bert, Bert Wilson caught the boy's attention, and they turned in time to see a young fellow take a flying leap over one of the fences and land in the midst of the group of excited welcoming friends make believe we're not glad to see you bert we thought you wouldn't be able to get off this year tom henderson spread that report where is he wait till i get him you ought to have a ducking and other undeserved threats were hurled at poor tom's innocent head hold on fellows said bert laughing Tom wasn't to blame. I didn't know myself that I could make the camp until yesterday. At that moment, the maligned Tom dashed up, nearly upsetting his friend in an ecstasy of delight. You're a brick with a capital B, and the best kind of a sight for sore eyes, gasped Tom, getting his breath back by degrees. I was never so glad to see anyone in my life. And you came just in the nick of time, too, to help us out. Then, dragging his friend away unceremoniously, Tom explained the situation in which he and the other volunteers found themselves. You will help us out, won't you, Bert? he asked appealingly. By the time the rest of the volunteers had come up and were eagerly awaiting the decision, when they heard Bert's hearty, surest thing you know, they went wild, and after giving him three cheers and a tiger, marched him off to the mess tent, there to partake of cornbread and maple syrup. This last had such a good effect on Bert as to lead him to say that the fellow who had never known the gastronomic delight of cornbread spread thick with maple syrup didn't know what it was to live. The dramatic arrival of Bert at the camp, just when they most felt the need of him, had been almost as unexpected to him as to the other campers. 
Through the recommendation of Mr. Hollis, he had secured a position with a large manufacturing business in New York. There, from the very start, he had made good, and his industry and ability were soon noted by his employer. It was not long before his salary was increased, and larger opportunities afforded him, and he soon found himself treading the path that was bound to lead to success. Of course, like every other healthy boy, he felt the need of friends and recreation. The first he found in Tom Henderson, with whom he struck up a great friendship. Another crony was Frank Edgewood, who worked on the same floor as himself. When the work of the day was done, they were usually found together, either in each other's rooms or at some of the places of wholesome recreation of which the city offers so great a variety. If Bert had one trait that stood out more prominently than any of the others, it was his love of mechanics. Anything in the way of a clever mechanical toy, a puzzle, or a machine attracted him immensely. He wanted to see the wheels go round, especially was this true in the case of automobiles, the huge machine moving so swiftly, so noiselessly, with such a sense of freedom and the sensation of flying, drew him like a magnet. He scarcely dared to dream that one day he might be the actual owner of a motor car. But he did hope that some day or other his hand might be on the wheel, his foot upon the brake, while he steered the flying monster as it sped like a flash across the country. His dream seemed perceptibly nearer being realized when Tom introduced him to the owner of the garage in the vicinity of his home. There he speedily became familiar with every joint and crank and lever of the great machines. He saw them taken apart and put together. He saw them brought in battered, broken, and almost wrecked, and made as good as new. From theory to practice was not far. Little by little, he was permitted to help in the minor repairs. After a while, he was entrusted with short trips, at first in the company of an experienced chauffeur, and at last on his own responsibility. It was not long before he felt capable to handle, steer, drive, and repair, and if he had cared to do so, he would have had no difficulty in passing an examination and securing a license to drive a car. His idea of recreation ran in the same direction. Whenever there was a motor meet anywhere within reach, especially on Saturday afternoon, which was half holiday at the factory, Bert could be found accompanied by either Tom, Frank, or both, watching with intense delight the exciting incidents of the race. The crowd, the start, the great machines flying by like streets of lightning, the roar of the partisans of each car as their favorite took the lead, and above all, the frantic excitement and enthusiasm at the finish as the victor flew across the line. All these things stirred his blood with inexpressible delight. On another occasion, he and his chums had visited the greatest show on earth. He had laughed at the clowns and been thrilled by the acrobats. Every pore of his body had drunk in with delight the tremendous feats of skill and daring that appeal so strongly to a boy. But the one supreme thrill, the one he never forgot, the one that repeated itself over and over again in his dreams, was when the automobile, with its daring operator, starting from the very top of the immense building, amid the death-like hush of the crowd, flew like a flash down the steep incline, sprang into space, turned a complete somersault, and, lighting on the further side of the gap, rushed across the arena. This was the climax of everything. Little else appealed to Bert. He talked of nothing else on the way home. There was no use talking. The auto fever was in his blood. With this passionate delight in his favorite machine, Bert's feeling can be understood 
when he learned that the chief feature of the boys' encampment when the summer opened was to be an automobile hike, the car itself having been kindly loaned by Mr. Hollis. At first, owing to conditions at the factory, he had feared that he would not be able to go at the time set for the encampment, and his disappointment was crushing. A quiet little talk of Mr. Hollis's with his employer, however, had adjusted things so that he learned at the last moment he would be able to go. We have already seen how uproariously he had been received by his old companions when he came so unexpectedly into the howling mob of enthusiasts at the summer camp. In less time after his arrival than it takes to tell, Bert was clad in khaki and had obtained the ready permission of Mr. Hollis to take the boys on their desired expedition. The fellows scrambled into their adored Red Scout with more haste than grace. While Bert was busy cranking it, then with a cry of all right back there and an answering shout of you bet your life, the great car started smoothly up the ascent. As it quickened its speed and disappeared around a bend in the road, more than one of the boys at the camp wished he'd been quicker to offer his services. If I'd only known that Bert would be here, I'd have been one of the first to volunteer. But I must say I wasn't so anxious to trust my neck to Bob's safekeeping. He doesn't know anything more about running an automobile than I do, and when Jim said that he was saying a great deal. Meanwhile, the Red Scout passengers were having the time of their lives. Gee, it's like flying, said Frank joyfully. It's a heap sight better, challenged Tom. Can't you make it go faster, he asked of Bert. I guess yes, Bert shouted as he put on more speed. The automobile darted forward like a live thing, and the boys were enraptured by the rapidity of its motion. It almost seemed to them as though the Red Scout were standing still and all the scenery were flying past. Hardly did the farmhouses come in sight than they were past and lost in the distance. Scores of timid little woodland creatures scurried away to the shelter of holes and empty logs, surprised and alarmed at the streak of red lightning that flashed by. Mother birds hovered protectively over their fledglings, ready to defend them against the whole world if necessary, while excited squirrels scolded noisily from the treetops long after they had any excuse for it. On, on they rushed along roads over which giant trees met, past meadowlands where cattle grazed lazily, over bridges, past sparkling brooks that formed miniature waterfalls as they rushed over the stones. On, on. As they slowed to take a sharp bend in the road, they came face to face with another automobile, dashing along at reckless speed. Fortunately, both Bert and the driver of the other machine kept their presence of mind. Before anyone had a chance to realize what was happening, Bert had swerved the scout way over to the right side of the road. There happened to be a fairly deep depression on that side, so Bert had the choice of two evils. He had either to crash squarely into the other automobile, or he had to run the risk of having his own machine turn turtle. He chose the lesser danger and ran into the ditch. However, it wasn't as bad as it easily might have been, for only the front and rear wheels on one side of the car were in the depression. Even at that, they came within a hair's breadth of being upset. As soon as the boys could pull themselves together, they tumbled out of the car. The occupants of the other car were four men, who sprang out at once to see if they could be of service in any way. I think we'd better improvise a lever, Bert suggested. That may look all right in print, grumbled Bob, but how are you going to do it? I know how we can work it all right, said one of the men. See those big stones over there? Well, the first thing to do is to bring them over here. Oh, I see what you mean to do, Bert chimed in eagerly. There are lots of big tree branches lying around. Looks as if they had been blown down in some storm. 
Guess you've got the right idea, son, said the man who had first spoken. Now let's get down to business. It was a work of time to place the stones in the right position and to pick out the branches that would stand the strain. It proved a tremendous task to lift the heavy car. At times they almost despaired of moving it. However, it was that very desperation that gave them the strength at last. Inch by inch, slowly, carefully, they finally forced the great car upward until, with a sigh of relief, they realized the task was finished. The boys dropped to the ground, exhausted by the unusual exertion. It doesn't take very long, though, for strong, healthy boys to recover from any strain, however great. So in a few minutes they were again in the car and ready to start for camp. It was too late to go further, and after thanking the men for their help, they started back, slowly this time. It was after dark when they reached camp, and Mr. Hollis, although confident of Bert's resourcefulness, was beginning to be slightly worried when the wanderers appeared at last upon the scene. In a very few moments, the half-famished boys were seated at a most appetizing meal, to which they did full justice. The rest of the fellows listened with great interest while Tom related the adventure. Bert and Mr. Hollis, at a little distance, discussed the events of the day and planned to renew the trip on the following morning. It was only when everything was quiet in the camp and the boys were supposed to be asleep that Tom, rising on his elbow, called out softly, Hello, are you asleep over there? Just turning the corner came a sleepy voice. We'll stay on this side for a minute. I was thinking that in that wild ride we never even looked for a place to pitch camp. Gee, that's so, came the voice, a little less sleepy this time. Well, of all the boneheads, we're the limit. I always thought my head was hard, but now I know it's solid. Oh, well, and again the voice grew sleepy. We'll have plenty of time tomorrow to think of that. I'm too tired now. Good night. I've just got to turn the corner, where Tom promptly joined him. End of chapter two. Recording by Tom Mack. Tucson, Arizona. Chapter 3 of Bert Wilson at the Wheel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Mack. Tucson, Arizona. Bert Wilson at the Wheel by J. W. Duffeld Chapter 3 The Copperhead Bright and early the next morning, Bert awoke to find the sunbeams playing all over his tent. He noticed lazily what funny spots they made on Tom's sleeping face. Then with a start he remembered that Tom had grumbled the night before because they would have to get up early to catch a mess of fish for breakfast. Thinking that he could wait a little until Tom woke up, he rolled off his cot onto the floor so that he could command a view of the brook through the open tent flap. He had just made himself comfortable when an irritable voice hailed him from the direction of Tom's cot. That you, Bert? What are you doing awake at this unearthly hour? Same as yourself, I suppose, came the calm reply. Humph! Well, you're not going to rout me out at five o'clock in the morning. Don't be a bear, Tom. We've got to help the fellows catch that fish. And you know it, so the sooner we start, the better. A couple of the fellows are down there now. Oh, well, I suppose we've got to then. Worse luck. They probably will guy us unmercifully, too, about yesterday. It's a wonder they didn't last night, which was all the credit the boys got for trying to save the feelings of the reckless volunteers. As the two comrades ran swiftly down to the water's edge, they noticed that Shorty, Philip Strong had been nicknamed Shorty because of his very small figure, was tugging hard at his line. Got a bite, Shorty, they shouted when they came within hailing distance. Bet your life and it's pulling like a good fellow, too. Better let me help. I'm stronger than you, offered Bob. 
who was sitting a little distance down the bank and whose luck hadn't been of the best up to that time. Now a very sore point with Shorty was his lack of strength, and whenever anybody referred to it, no matter with what good intentions, he always bristled up as if a personal insult. This morning that very touchiness proved to be his undoing, for as he got to his feet intending to inform Bob that he could do very well without any of his help, the fish gave a sudden jerk to the line that made Shorty lose his balance and tumble head first into the water. The boys, convulsed with laughter, fished him up, dripping and sheepish without thanking the boys for their help. Shorty zigzagged up to the tent, making, it must be convinced, a rather sorry figure. When they finally had managed to get the line up, they found that the cause of Shorty's undoing had escaped. Poor little Shorty, he's always getting into trouble, one of the boys said, when he had breath enough. Then, as the time was getting short, they all settled down in good earnest to their task, and before the camp was awake at half-past six, had caught a corking mess, as they expressed it. Each tent poured forth its several occupants. The fishermen took their morning's catch to the mess tent and went to report, some of them with sinking hearts, it is to be feared, to Mr. Hollis. However, the leader was very lenient with the offenders, merely reprimanding their carelessness and cautioning them not again to forget that they had pledged their word of honor to render him the most absolute obedience in every particular. Upon the boys eagerly promising that they wouldn't offend again and upon Bert's asking to be allowed to have another chance to find the campsite, permission was given and they sauntered away, filled with the happy anticipation of laurels still to be won. Soon after breakfast, the Red Scout was brought out, and the original volunteers, their ranks swelled by three new recruits, Shorty among them, started off up the hill amid the cheers and good wishes of the fellows. For an hour they rode steadily uphill and down dale, until they saw far off through the trees the faint gleam of water. Running the auto into the woods for a short distance, they all jumped out and started to investigate. The boys thought they had never seen the woods when they were as beautiful as on that day. They had not gone very far before Bert, who was in the lead, called back. Come here, fellows, and see this grove of chestnut trees. Isn't it great? The boys all hurried forward and there, sure enough, was a regular colony of chestnut trees, their huge branches giving promise of abundant harvest when the frost came. Say, fellows, it's a shame not to be able to get any good out of these nuts that are sure to be so plentiful in the fall. Don't you suppose we might arrange to stay until the frost comes? Shorty asked. I think we ought to be able to fix it up, said Frank. We can ask Mr. Hollis about it anyway. Then they started again on the lookout for other finds. All the way along, they came across numbers of clear, cold springs and never failed to test each one. More than once, they had to cross brooks on stones that were not over steady, and at one time, a very loose one nearly caused Shorty another ducking. At last, they reached the border of the woods and looked upon a sight that held them spellbound. There before them was a smooth, grassy stretch of ground, dotted here and there with beautiful spreading oak trees. Sloping gently down, it stopped at the edge of a clear, transparent lake that reflected the radiant brightness of the sun. On the other side, the ground was level for a short distance, and then rose, forming a small hill, richly carpeted with low shrubs and gorgeously colored wild flowers. Branches of trees drooped low over the lake as if trying to catch their own reflections in its clear depths. Birds twittered and sang in the branches, joyously mingling their bubbling notes with the music of a rippling brook nearby. It seemed as if the soft voice of nature spoke to them in the murmuring of the trees, sang to them in the song of the birds, joyously called to them in the babble of the brook, smiled a welcome to them, from the bright surface of the lake. Gee, said Tom, drawing a long breath, it sure is wonderful. Wonderful, Bert explained. It's by far the most beautiful place 
I've had the luck to locate. Come on, fellas, let's take a look around. So look around they did and found everything about this ideal spot was all they could possibly ask for and more. After examining everything in sight, they found they were just about starved. So they sat down under one of the trees near the lake and spread out the contents of the lunch basket. After a feast of chicken, canned salmon, cornbread, maple syrup, and sweetened lemon juice, which when mixed with the cold spring water made a very tempting drink, they started off with the empty lunch basket, the latter being, as one of the boys remarked, heap sight lighter than it was when we started. That's all right, said Frank, but I feel a heap sight heavier. If I'd eaten as much as you have, Philip Strong, Frank retorted, I wouldn't be able to walk. Speaking of eating, said Shorty, sniffing the air inquiringly, do any of you fellows smell cucumbers? What's the matter, Shorty? Has little dunking you indulge in this morning addled your brains? Who ever heard of cucumbers in the woods, said Frank contemptuously. I know it sounds foolish, but it's the truth just the same, said Shorty, stood his ground stoutly. Shorty's right, boys. I noticed the cucumber smell quite a while ago, and it seems to grow stronger the further we go, said Bert. By George, that's so. I smell it myself now. I do too, so did I. And various other exclamations of the same sort showed that Shorty was right. The boys scattered all over trying to locate the odor, which was very strong at this time. Tom was the first to discover the cause of it. At his low imperative, Come here, quick fellows, but don't make a noise. They all ran to see what was the matter. Excitedly, he pointed to a long, copper-colored snake that seemed to be watching a bird's nest built low in one of the branches. The mother bird was hovering distractedly over her nest, uttering shrill, excited cries that brought her mate to her side. Just then, the snake coiled, ready to strike, and the boys looked around desperately for stones, but Bert had gotten ahead of them. As soon as he had seen what was happening, he had slipped noiselessly away to a brook they had just passed, and, snatching up a heavy stone, had hurried back to the scene of the tragedy. So as soon as the snake had its head in a position to strike, he hurled the stone directly at it. Slowly and convulsively, the snake untwined and finally lay still. It's strange I didn't think of that cucumber smell being caused by a copperhead, said Bert. I used to kill them every once in a while when I was at my uncle's farm. Just then, Tom called their attention to the mother bird. Doesn't it seem as if she were thanking us? And it really did seem so. The little bird had settled back on her nest, with her black eyes fixed gratefully on her rescuers, and making little low gurgling noises way down in her throat. Nearby on a low branch, the father bird was swaying back and forth, pouring out his musical notes straight from a little heart bursting with gratitude and joy. Leaving the happy family to its own devices, the boys took up the trail again. In high spirits, they chased each other over fallen logs and through dense foliage, peered into squirrels' holes and rabbits' burrows, commented upon the appearance and habits of sly little chipmunk and other interesting woodland creatures. Before they realized it, they had come upon the Red Scout, standing just as they had left it in his leafy garage. While they were on their way home, they examined the snake skin. It was a beauty of its kind. It was about a yard long, and the sixteen copper-red moccasin-shaped stripes were very clearly defined. As soon as they reached camp, they gave in their report to Mr. Hollis. The boys all crowded around, eager to hear about the snake and the campsite. The heroes of the day were deluged with questions. How did you get it? Have you found a good place for camp? Where is it? What does it look like? Tell us about it. Finally, Mr. Hollis, seeing how tired and hungry they were, came to their rescue, proposing that they eat their supper first and save the tale of adventure until the camp council. At first they agreed rather hesitatingly, but as an appetizing smell issued forth from the mess tent, they found they couldn't get there fast enough. After supper, the boys made a roaring fire and squatted around it, waiting for the roll call. Then Mr. Hollis called the roll, beginning with Adams and ending with Taylor. 
as everybody was there the reports were called for each boy reported his adventures and experiences during the day all of which would have been intensely interesting to the boys as a rule but they were so anxious to hear bert's report that they passed over the others quickly when at last bert's turn came they all crowded forward with eager interest and they were not disappointed bert told his story simply and well and was not once interrupted when the tale was finished the boys fairly exploded cries of isn't it great everything is sure going our way this year mingled with how did you manage to get the stone without the snake hearing you what are you going to do with the skin now that you've got it and to all bert gave a satisfactory answer it was a long time before the boys could quiet down and even then they felt like hearing something exciting who can tell a good ghost story bob asked dave's the boy come on dave put on your thinking cap dave ferris had been elected official storyteller at the beginning because he always had a stock on hand and they were generally thrilling tales of adventure or weird ghost stories the kind that boys always revel in dave was silent thinking for a little while then he said all right boys here goes are you ready to a chorus of sure thing fire away and break the speed limit they all gathered closer together around the fire and dave began his story end of chapter three Recording by Tom Mack, Tucson, Arizona. Chapter 4 of Bert Wilson at the Wheel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen. Bert Wilson at the Wheel by J.W. Duffield chapter four the challenge dave certainly could not complain of a bored or indifferent audience even mr hollis was absorbed and listened with a smile on his kindly face he was always intensely interested in anything the boys said or did and was never happier than when he saw that they were especially enjoying themselves dave had just reached the most thrilling part of his story and in their imaginations the boys could hear the wailings of the ghost and the clanking of his chains he was describing the awful appearance of its sunken fiery eyes when shorty happened to glance apprehensively around and immediately emitted a blood-curdling yell the ghost the ghost he stammered pointing in the direction of the road all leaped to their feet and followed the direction of shorty's trembling finger and for a moment even bert wilson felt a queer little tightening sensation about the heart for there apparently coming directly toward them were the fiery eyes that dave had just described with such gusto why you simps laughed bert that's no ghost or if it is it is the most solid spook i ever heard of those are the acetylene lamps of another auto and as he spoke he exchanged significant glances with mr hollis somewhat ashamed of having been so startled the boys now fell to guessing at the mission of the strange car they had not long to wait in a few minutes they could hear the purring of its exhaust and soon a great gray automobile dashed into camp and drew up in front of the fire from it descended a genial-looking man apparently of about the same age as mr hollis followed by five clean-cut young fellows mr hollis and mr thompson as the newcomer's name proved to be evidently knew each other and shook hands heartily meanwhile the camp boys mingled with their unexpected guests and with the freemasonry of youth soon became chummy the only fault perhaps that could be found with the new arrivals was that they seemed to be a trifle overbearing and evidently thought that their car which they called the gray ghost could beat any other automobile ever made it is needless to state that bert's crowd felt the same way regarding the red scout so that the boys were soon engaged in a heated argument concerning the respective merits of their cars why maintain tom hotly you fellows have no idea what our red scout can do in the way of speed and hill climbing just to-day we were out on a run and though i didn't actually time it i am dead sure that there were stretches where we did as well as a mile a minute what do you think of that he asked triumphantly indeed 
this seems to cool the visitors down somewhat and they exchange surprised glances but they soon recovered their confidence and went on to describe the speed qualities of their car with ever-increasing enthusiasm it was just a short time ago said one whose name turned out to be ralph quinby that we took the gray ghost around the old racetrack just outside the town and we averaged over fifty miles an hour we could have gone much faster too only mr thompson would not let us i'll just bet your auto couldn't go as fast as that it was now the turn of their hosts to look doubtful they were sure however that the red scout could hold its own with any other car and as they thought of their idolized driver bert wilson their confidence came back with a rush well replied tom drawing a long breath you fellows evidently think you could win in a race and we just know that we could so i guess the only way to settle the dispute is to run off a race somewhere and prove which is the better machine i know we'd be willing if you would wouldn't we boys there was a chorus of approving shouts from his companions but the visitors only smiled in a superior fashion and evidently thought there could be but one conclusion to any race in which their car was entered meanwhile mr hollis and mr thompson were holding an earnest conversation in which the latter seemed to be urging some point about which mr hollis apparently hesitated in fact mr thompson was trying to get mr hollis to give his consent to a race between the cars owned by the two camps but the latter thought that it would involve too much risk for the boys who drove the machines you see it's this way he was saying you and i thompson are responsible for the safety of these boys we both feel toward them as though they belonged to us and if anything happened to them we would never forgive ourselves it seems to me too big a risk to take merely for the sake of seeing who owns the faster car yes you're dead right there of course returned mr thompson but then i don't think the risk is so great as you imagine i have seen the track they would use provided the race was run and i think there would be little if any danger the track has not been used for several years and most of the fence is missing so that if they ran off the course itself it would only be a matter of running over the grass until they stopped you know me well enough to realize that i would not sanction anything that contained too large an element of peril as for the slight risk that undoubtedly exists it seems to me that it would not hurt the boys to take it and it would teach them self-reliance and confidence as far as that goes said mr hollis smiling reluctantly my boys have too much confidence in themselves and i have to be constantly curbing their tendencies toward taking chances however i have every confidence in your judgment so i suppose i might as well consent this once i wish to have it understood however that this is the last as well as the first race they ever run win or lose that suits me all right so i guess we can consider it settled answered mr thompson what do you say to going over and having a look at the machines you haven't seen our car yet have you no that's a pleasure still in store for me replied mr hollis and the two men rose and strolled over to where the cars stood their brass work glittering in the light of the dancing campfire by this time most of the boys had gathered around the cars but they saluted and made way respectively for their leaders as they came up they both smiled when they saw bert and ralph quinby for they were so engrossed in the discussion of the respective merits and appliances of their cars that they did not even notice the coming of their leaders such terms as gear ratios revolutions per minute and three point suspension filled the air and mr hollis whispered to mr thompson i'll wager that those boys saturate their handkerchiefs with gasoline so that whenever they get a block away from a machine they can smell gasoline and feel at home again wouldn't be surprised if they did laughed mr thompson here you fellows come out of your trance called dick and bert and ralph turned quickly around and saluted their leaders returned the salute and mr thompson said well i suppose both you boys think you have a pretty fast machine there how would you like to have a test of speed there was a chorus of excited cries and exclamations from the boys 
and their leaders smiled indulgently bert stepped forward and said i think sir that i speak for mr quinby as well as myself when i say that nothing would suit us better ralph gave a nod of assent and bert went on we will both promise to be cautious and i think if we take proper precautions we will be able to run off a good race without an accident how long do you think the race ought to be how long is the track that you propose using inquired mr hollis why it's just one mile isn't it ralph asked mr thompson yes sir replied ralph well it seems to me said mr thompson that ten miles that is ten full laps around the track ought to be about right will that be satisfactory to you mr hollis yes i can see no objection to that replied the latter what day shall we have the race how would a week from to-day suit you let me see that will be tuesday won't it i guess that will be satisfactory to all concerned how do you boys feel about it they voiced a unanimous assent to these arrangements and both sides started discussing the various chances and possibilities of the contest but with perfect good humor and friendly feeling it was now getting late however and the discipline of the camps could not be too much relaxed even in the face of such an important event as this accordingly hearty farewells were exchanged and the visitors climbed into their big gray car all the boys gathered around expectantly to note the behavior of the car when it started and it must be admitted that even bert wilson's expert eye could find no defect in the handling or running of the rival machine ralph started it smoothly and without a jerk and soon all they could see of it was the angry gleam of its red tail light as they turned away to prepare for sleep jim remarked ah i bet we'll have a walk over in that race bert knew better however and was convinced that he would have to use every ounce of power that the red scout possessed to beat the gray ghost but one thing he was sure of and that was that whoever won it was going to be a mighty close race he did not make the mistake of underrating his rival as so many boys in his position would have done but made up his mind to do the very best he could right from the start for a long time he stood staring at the red scout and then raised its shining hood and patted the spotless cylinders i guess we can do it old boy but you will have to stand by me and work as you have never worked before he said and gently lowered the hood and walked off toward his tent End of chapter 4chapter five of bert wilson at the wheel this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen bert wilson at the wheel by j w duffield chapter five the hoboes and the bees early in the morning the boys began to break camp and start for the new location groups of three or four were detailed by mr hollis to accomplish certain tasks and they started to carry out his directions right merrily some were sent to store the provisions and cooking utensils others to take down the tents and gather together their blankets and other bedding still others got together the fishing tackle and all was done to the accompaniment of songs and jests and laughter so that before they knew it everything was ready to dump into the old farm wagons they had hired for the purpose when everything was packed in the wagon that would possibly go in mr hollis selected tom to ride beside the driver and show him where to go after the wagon had started off some of the boys own personal belongings that were left over were put in the red scout and seven of the fellows scrambled in some way trust boys to find room if there is any to be found and started away after the wagon they soon passed it and went on until they came to the turn in the road where the lake could be dimly seen through the trees there bert stopped and the boys got out taking the packages with them shorty had been detailed to lead them to the lake and then to come back and wait for the farm wagon then bert went back to pick up mr hollis and dick trent who had stayed behind to see that nothing had been forgotten on the way back he passed the wagon and hailed tom with a how are you getting along old man pretty badly i thank you 
i wish mr hollis had picked out somebody else for this job some one who didn't care if he spent hours getting nowhere tom replied sourly cheer up the worst is yet to come laughed bert never mind even the worst trials have to end some time he added consolingly and started off again while tom looked enviously after the red car now fast disappearing in the distance when bert reached the old campsite now looking very bare and forlorn he found mr hollis and the boys waiting impatiently for him mr hollis and dick got in followed by six of the boys bert promised to come back for the rest right away and the red scout started off with its second load in a little while for bert had found a second and much shorter road to the lake they came once more to campers crossing as the boys had named it there they found that the wagon had just arrived with its load but the boys had delayed unloading it until mr hollis should reach the scene of action in a minute the camp master had taken charge and the boys were busy unloading and carrying everything to the camp once more bert started back with the reliable red scout for his last load when he got to the old camp the boys greeted him with the news that jem dawson had disappeared and couldn't be found anywhere he was here just a few minutes ago said steve thomas but when i went to ask him a question just now he was gone we have hunted high and low but we can't find a trace of him bert was troubled at first but suddenly a thought struck him and his face lighted up as he exclaimed i think i can explain the mystery follow me fellows he then led them through a dense thicket to the side of a hill covered with underbrush pulling a bush aside he disclosed to the boys astonished gaze a great black hole which was evidently the mouth of a cave come on out jim bert called we don't want to keep mr hollis waiting too long you know jim dawson was one of those hungry boys who never can get enough to eat so having discovered the cave one day while chasing a butterfly he had secretly brought food there in a tin box so that if he chanced to get hungry he always had something to eat at hand bert had discovered the cave and its secret long ago but he was not given to tale bearing and so had kept his own counsel as bert spoke a sound was heard inside the cave and in a minute out came the culprit with an accusing piece of cornbread in his hand blinking like an owl brought suddenly into the glare of the sun at the look of complete surprise and dismay on his face the boys burst into a shout of laughter oh you lemon gasped steve you full-sized lemon how did you ever manage to get away with it no wonder we have been short of grub lately dave said holding his sides as if he were afraid he would burst ah uh, i don't see why you can't leave a fellow alone said jim sulkily i only brought grub here that belonged to me don't be sore jim bert said good-naturedly i wouldn't have disturbed you if we hadn't been in a hurry that reminds me that we've wasted a good deal of valuable time already i guess we had better be getting along at that they all started back on the run and soon had jim in such a good humor that he even told them how he had escaped being found out by a narrow margin many a time and that nobody but bert had ever suspected the cave's existence they all piled into the red scout in a hurry because they feared that mr hollis would worry on account of their prolonged absence they arrived at campers crossing just in time to carry the last barrel of provisions when they reached the new camp the boys were surprised to see how much had been done in their absence the tents had been set up and from the mess tent came the clattering of utensils and the savory odor of creamed salmon on toast soon the call to dinner was heard and the boys all gathered around the table chattering like magpies it seems as if we'd always camped here said shorty there's something about the place that makes you feel at home right away it's the classiest place i've ever been in dave ferris declared enthusiastically it makes you imagine that nature might have had a little time on her hands and devoted it to making this one spot a little paradise here here tom cried clapping his hands in mock praise dave will be a poet if he doesn't look out give us some more old man the sample's good 
you'd better be careful how you beard the lion in his den the ferris in his hall said dick trent warningly he won't favor us with any more stories if you are not careful how you offend him i'd just as soon he'd spot all the poetry he wants to if it relieves him any as long as he doesn't forget how to tell stories shorty remarked as he contentedly munched a piece of toast how very kind of you said dave sarcastically i thank you with all my heart for your liberality my which say dave if that ever belonged to me i call you all to witness that i disown it from this time on it's no friend of mine from this time on you'd better hang on to it shorty it's the best kind of thing to have around at times said mr hollis as he rose to leave the table in the afternoon scouting parties were sent out in all directions to find out the nature of the surrounding country steve thomas bert tom bob shorty and jim dawson were sent off to scour the woods in an easterly direction from the lake for a considerable distance they tramped along talking of the different plants and shrubs they came across and naming the birds they saw in the trees they threw peanuts to the squirrels that peeped inquiringly at them from branches over their heads or ventured shyly from the shelter of their holes they imitated the clear notes of the birds until the little songsters paused to look wonderingly at these strange creatures that could not fly and yet sang like themselves timid little rabbits watched the boys with soft brown eyes not knowing whether or not to sally forth from their security even for the tempting carrot that bert held out so coaxingly when he threw it at a distance however one little fellow braver than the others his appetite overcoming his fears ran forth quickly snatched the carrot and scurried back in a panic to his burrow where with his bright eyes fixed on these humans who had been so kind to him he ate contentedly suddenly the quiet woods rang with shouts and cries the barking of a dog and the noise of people running to and fro furiously alarmed the boy started on a run for the place from which the cries seemed to come they fairly gasped when they came upon the cause of all the commotion three men of the roughest order were dancing distractedly around trying to beat off a swarm of bees that surrounded them and yelling like mad while a big collie dog wild with excitement barked with all his might say this is better than a circus shorty shouted only i'm glad that those hoboes and not i are the whole show now shut up shorty the question now is what we can do to help the poor fellows out said tom then turning to the tramps he yelled you'd better make a dive for the brook and get under water it's right through the trees to your left he added as the men now nearly crazy with pain started to follow his advice rushing frantically to the brook they plunged in head first while the bees deprived of their prey flew off angrily into the woods to search for new victims upon which they might vent their spite when the tramps came up dripping from the water they were a sight to behold their faces were swollen so that their eyes seemed to be mere slits and their ears appeared to be twice their natural size the boys at once ran to get mud to put on the red angry wounds the tramps submitted with indifferent grace to the treatment grumbling that they didn't see what good being all smeared up with mud was going to do as soon as the boys had done what they could to ease the pain the tramps declared that they would have to be moving on because them pesky critters might come back to finish up their business so the boys watched the strange company of sullen muttering men disappear through the trees as they were lost to view the comical sight of the adventure struck shorty and he began to laugh and the longer he laughed the harder he laughed the others caught the infection and in a second the woods were ringing with the unrestrained roars of the boys they laughed until they could laugh no more and then lay on the grass gasping for breath oh they did look so funny said shorty between gasps i never shall forget that sight until my dying day at that minute bert sat up suddenly exclaiming fellows look who's here with one accord they turned and saw the collie which they had entirely forgotten sitting near and regarding them with inquiring wistful eyes come here beauty 
bert called and the dog came unhesitatingly and stuck his cold black muzzle in bert's hand did they desert you old fellow bert asked putting his arm around the dog's neck the collie waved his beautiful brush and lifting his soft eyes to bert's face saw something there that made him his slave for evermore for the collie with true dog instinct had recognized that in bert he had a friend i wonder where those tramps got him probably swiped him doesn't look as if he'd had very good treatment he doesn't and it's a shame too isn't he a beauty were some of the comments of the boys as they gathered around the dog patting his head gently the collie waved his tail and in his eyes was a great longing for sympathy and love and you may be sure the boys gave him what he asked for tired out the boys finally went back to camp followed by their new friend who soon became a favorite with everyone that night don as they called the dog sat with the rest around the campfire and answered whenever they spoke to him with a wave of his silver brush bert made him a bed on the floor of his tent and don gladly took possession of it just before he got into bed bert put his hand on the dog's head saying i guess we're going to be good friends aren't we old fellow and don looking up in his master's face with eyes that held a world of gratitude and love answered to bert's entire satisfaction end of chapter five chapter six of bert wilson at the wheel this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen bert wilson at the wheel by j w duffield chapter six shorty goes to the ant the next morning when the boys drew aside the flaps of their tents the sky was dark and lowering a good many anxious glances were thrown at the clouds and open disapproval of the outlook was not slow in breaking out gee what a fearful day said jim you bet it is chimed in shorty that's our luck wailed dave just when i wanted to go to town to get a new blade for the jack-knife i broke yesterday oh come off it you pessimists sang out bert who had just plunged his head in a bucket of cold water and now was rubbing his face until it shone somewhere the sun is shining heap of good that does us grumbled shorty but say as he turned to bert suspiciously what sort of thing was that you called us i said you were pessimists well what does that jawbreaker mean why said bert who could not resist his propensity to tease that means that you are not optimists worse and worse and more of it complained shorty that's just as clear as mud echoed jim well said bert tantalizingly listen my children listen my children and you shall hear of the midnight ride of paul revere chanted frank who had recited that identical poem in his elocution class at the last term of school a well-aimed pillow made him duck and bert resumed you see shorty it's just like this the optimist is the fellow that sees the doughnut the pessimist sees only the hole in the doughnut now for my part there is no nourishment in the hole but there is lots of it in the doughnut ah say don't make a fellow's mouth water said shorty before whose practical vision rose up his mother's kitchen fragrant with the smell of the crisp brown sizzling beauties as they were lifted from the pan and me so far from home if there were no doughnuts at the breakfast to which all hands came running their place was more than taken by the golden cornbread and the savory bacon that formed the meal to which they sat down with all the enthusiasm of hungry boys the food disappeared as if by magic and the table had been replenished more than once before the boys cried enough many a sated millionaire would have willingly exchanged a substantial part of his hoarded wealth for one of those unjaded appetites but in pure undiluted satisfaction the boys would have been the losers by the exchange 
that very thought struck mr hollis as he watched the havoc made at table by these valiant young trenchermen and turning to dick who sat at his right he spoke of the starving king midas jim who overheard the name which as he said was a new one on him wanted to know who midas was and how if he were a king he couldn't get grub enough to keep him from starving the boys who had by this time taken the first keen edge off their appetite were equally eager to hear the story and mr hollis went on to tell about the avaricious king of the olden time who could never get enough but was always asking the gods for more after a while they became wearied and disgusted and granted his request that everything he touched should turn to gold the king was delighted at this beyond all measure now at last he was to have his heart's desire he put the gift to the test at once he touched his sword and it changed to gold that was fine he stroked his beard and every hair became a glistening yellow spike that wasn't so fine he began to get a little worried wasn't this too much of a good thing well anyway there was no use in fretting he would go to dinner and get his mind off but when he touched the food it too became gold he lifted a goblet of wine only to find that he held molten metal in the midst of plenty he was starving upon his knees he begged the gods to take back their fatal gift and thinking he had learned his lesson well they did so his gold vanished but oh how delicious was the first taste of food and to-day concluded mr hollis there is many a millionaire whose gold doesn't give him the pleasure that a square meal gives the ravenous appetite of a healthy boy well said tom expressing the general sentiment i'd sure like the money but oh you cornbread after breakfast the boys broke up into separate groups one went off under the guidance of mr hollis to gather some fossils that were to be found in great abundance in the limestone that jutted out from a quarry at a little distance from the camp another group of the fellows with dick in charge who were especially interested in bird and insect life the bug squad as they were commonly and irreverently referred to in camp went to a little clearing about half a mile away that was especially rich in specimens the day before tom had secured an uncommonly beautiful species of butterfly that topped anything in his experience so far and the other boys wanted to add one to their rapidly growing collection whether the lowering day had anything to do or not with the absence of these fluttering beauties who loved the sunshine their search was without result and after two hours spent in this way they threw aside their butterfly nets and sat down in the shade of a spreading beach to rest and as shorty called it to have a gab fest almost directly beneath the eastern branches was a large mound nearly three feet above the surrounding level and perhaps twenty feet in circumference as shorty flung himself down on the centre of the mound a curious expression came into the eyes of dick he glanced quickly at frank who returned his look and added a wink that might have aroused suspicion in shorty's mind had not that guileless youth been lying stretched out at full length with his hat over his eyes the warmth and general mugginess of the air saturated almost to the reigning point together with the constant activity of the last two hours had tired him out and after a little badinage growing less and less spirited he began to doze the other boys who had been given the tip by frank and dick let the conversation drag on purpose and with a wicked glint of mischief in their eyes watched the unsuspecting shorty slip away into the land of sleep soon his arms relaxed his chest rose and fell with his regular breathing and horrors an undeniable snore told that shorty was not faking but was off for good from being a spot of perfect peace and quiet the mound suddenly burst into life from numberless gates a swarm of ants issued forth and rushed about here and there to find out the cause of this invasion the weight of shorty's body and his movements as he composed himself for sleep had aroused them to a sense of danger and they poured out in thousands soon the ground was covered with little patches of black and red ants and as though by common consent they began to surround the unconscious shorty some crept up his legs others his arms while others climbed over his collar and slipped inside 
first an arm twitched violently then a sleepy hand stole down and scratched his leg the boys were bursting with laughter and tim grew black in the face as he crowded his handkerchief into his mouth shorty shook his head as a horse does when a fly lights on it again he twitched and this time seemed to realize that there was something wrong still half asleep he snapped ah why don't you fellows quit your kidding stop tickling me with that a yell ended the sentence as a nip more vicious than usual brought shorty to his feet this time wide awake beyond all question he cast one glance at the boys who now made no pretense of restraint but roared with laughter then he saw the swarm of ants surrounding him and took in the situation he tore his hat from his head his coat from his shoulders shook off his tormentors and spinning around like a dancing dervish dashed off toward the brook a moment later there was a splash and they heard shorty blowing sputtering diving rubbing until finally he had rid himself of the swarms that clung closer to him than a brother at last he succeeded and came up the bank before resuming his clothes he had to take each garment separately and search every seam and crease to make sure that not a single ant remained then he came back into the group like a raging lion his temper never was any of the best and the sudden awakening from sleep the stings and ticklings of the invaders and perhaps most of all the unrestrained laughter of the boys had filled his cup to the brim he saw red as the saying is and regardless of age and size was rushing toward the rest with doubled-up fists and rage in his heart when dick caught him by the wrists and held him in his strong grasp until his fury had spent itself somewhat and he began to get control of himself phil said dick he never called him shorty and at this moment that recollection helped to sober the struggling boy remember that the first duty of boy or man is to control his temper the boys didn't mean any harm it looked to them like a splendid joke and perhaps we let it go a little too far i am really to blame more than any one else because i am older and in charge of the squad i am awfully sorry phil and i beg your pardon the kindly tone and sincere apology were not lost on phil who was not without a sense of humor which through all his anger began to struggle to the surface the other boys too thoughtless and impulsive though they may be were sound and kind of heart and following dick's example crowded about phil and joined in the apology the most flaming anger must melt before such expressions of regard and good will and phil was at last compelled to smile sheepishly and say that it was all right your sport phil all right called out frank and at this highest of commendations from a boy's point of view the last vestige of phil's resentment faded away well anyway fellows he said i don't bear any grudge against you but i am sure going to get even with those pesky ants i never did care much for ants anyway i've been told so often to go to the ant thou sluggard that now i'm going to them for fair and what i do to them will be a plenty as he said this he turned toward the ant hill as though to demolish it but dick put up a friendly hand no phil said he you wouldn't destroy a wonderful and beautiful palace would you palace said phil in amazement thinking for a moment that dick was stringing him what do you mean by that just what i say returned dick a wonderful and beautiful palace there is a queen there and she walks about every day in state surrounded by a throng of courtiers there are princesses there that are taken out daily to get the air accompanied by a governess exactly as you have seen a group of boarding-school girls walking out with their teachers surrounding the palace is a city where there are hundreds of carpenters and farmers and sentinels and soldiers if you waited round a while you would see the farmers going out to milk their cows at that point dick was interrupted by a roar of laughter that burst from every boy at once they had listened in growing amazement that had rapidly become stupefaction but this was really too much what was the matter with dick was it a joke a parable a fairy story they might be kids all right but there was a limit to everything and when dick talked of ants going out to milk the cows well it was up to him to explain himself or prove his statement 
and that they felt sure he could never do dick waited good-naturedly while they pelted him with objections and plied him with questions then he took from his kit a strong magnifying glass and told them that he was going to prove to them all what he had said he laughs best who laughs last he said and i am going to show you that all i said is true that is he modified i cannot prove everything just now as i would have to destroy this wonderful palace if i were to try to show you how marvellous it is and how perfect in all its appointments but what we don't see ourselves has been seen time and time again by hundreds of wise and truthful men and their testimony is as strong as though it were given under oath in a court of law well said frank i'm willing to take everything else on faith but i'm afraid i'd have to see the milking done myself in order to believe it all right said dick as it happens that is just the thing i can show you more easily than anything else the boys crowded eagerly around him end of chapter six chapter seven of bert wilson at the wheel this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by diana schmidt bert wilson at the wheel by j w duffield the ants go milking you know said dick as the boys threw themselves down at the side of the mound and looked at it with an entirely new interest if these were african ants you wouldn't be taking any such liberties with them instead of hanging around this mound you would be running away like all possessed and if you didn't make tracks in a hurry the only thing left here would be your skeleton picked as clean as the one you saw the other day in old dr sanford's office what cried jim do you mean to say that i would run away from a little thing like an ant not in your life i wouldn't let's see said dick you'd run away from a boa constrictor wouldn't you who wouldn't retorted jim well if you'd run away from the boa constrictor and he'd run away from the ants where do you get any license to face the ants do you mean to say that those monster snakes are afraid of such tiny things i should say they were replied dick the ants go from place to place through the great african forest in countless numbers millions at a time a regular army of them nothing can stand before them they strip every shrub eat every blade of grass they swarm over every living thing they find in their way sometimes they come across a snake unawares and climb all over him he squirms and twists and rushes away trying to brush them off against the bushes at last he turns and bites frantically but they never let up they actually eat him alive and in less than ten minutes they pass on leaving his bones picked clean as a whistle the natives take their wives and children and flee for their lives whenever they see an army of ants approaching but that of course has nothing to do with these little american neighbors of ours they are perfectly harmless and though they are fierce scrappers among themselves inflict no injury on any one else and there is nothing in the whole animal or insect world except perhaps the bees that have a society and government so much like that of men in one respect they are like their african brothers and that is in their fondness for travel every once in a while they make up their minds to emigrate and then they fly in swarms of millions what interrupted frank do you mean to say they fly i never knew that an ant had wings of course they have said dick they often have to cross rivers to get to their new home how could they do that without wings oh i don't know hummed shorty the bed-bug has no wings at all but he gets there just the same a rather severe glance from dick quenched phil's exuberant spirits which had all come back to him since his ducking 
now continued dick these swarms are sometimes so vast that they darken the sun in certain localities men working on high buildings have been surrounded and almost blinded by them while these emigrations last they are a bother if not a peril and the only ones that are really happy are the fish in the brooks and rivers over which they pass sometimes the surface is fairly black with them and the trout and little troutlings have the time of their lives once the flight is ended however and the new locality is chosen the wings disappear nature has no use for needless things and from that time on the air knows them no more the carpenter ants get busy right away the place is marked off as accurately as a surveyor marks out a plot in the suburbs of a city the queen ant is given a royal room apart from all the others she is a good mother and takes the best care of her little ones as they grow older they in turn help the queen to care for their little brothers and sisters they are excessively neat and clean in their personal habits they spend hours preening and combing and cleaning until they are immaculate regular dudes muttered jim well said tom that's something that will never be laid up against you jim jim who indeed had a hard time keeping up to a high ideal of cleanliness and whose hair was usually tumbled while his nails too often were draped in mourning looked a little confused and while he was thinking of something to hurl at tom dick went on there is one thing however about the ants that i don't admire they like to get somebody else to do their work a certain number of their own colony are hewers of wood and drawers of water for the rest indeed the aristocrats among them get so lazy after a while that they will not even feed themselves the workers not only have to hustle for the grub but actually have to feed it to the lords and dukes and talking of hustling for grub just look here the boys followed the direction of dick's finger and there coming up a little beaten path they saw a procession of ants dragging along a big fat caterpillar it had evidently put up a good fight judging from the numbers that had been necessary to capture it but they had proved too strong a little convulsive movement showed that it was not yet quite dead but it no longer made any resistance the formic acid that the ants secrete had partly paralyzed it and made defense impossible there was an almost comical disproportion between its large helpless bulk and the tiny size of its conquerors but this was a case where numbers counted the victors all pulled like good fellows and passing through one of the entrances of the mound finally dragged their booty into the inner cave another thing said dick when the keenly interested boys had again gathered about him the red ants are slaveholders. When their working force has been weakened or diminished, they get a big army together and raid some colony of black ants a few hundred feet or yards distant in order to carry them away as slaves. There is nothing haphazard or slouchy about the way they go about it. Everything is arranged as carefully and precisely as in the case of an American or European power getting ready to go to war at a given signal the troops come out and get in order of battle there is perfect order and system everywhere when there is a very large army a sort of hum or buzz arises from it almost as though they were beating drums to inspire the soldiers for battle they march forward in perfect time and dash upon the enemy with irresistible fury the black ants through their scouts have been told of the enemy's approach and have made all the preparation they can to beat them off the infant ants together with their household goods have been tucked away in upper galleries where they can see the fight but not be in it reserved seats as it were murmured frank the ants have two weapons one is the nipper that can cut off the enemy's head as neatly as a pair of shears then they have the formic acid that used against ants or other insects has a poisonous quality 
with both of these weapons they fight with the greatest desperation until victory declares for one side or the other the red ants are usually victorious as they are larger and stronger and more aggressive in case they win they carry away all the little ones of their black opponents and bring them up as slaves they are treated kindly and after a while seem to grow content and take their place as the humbler members of the community after the battle is over the wounded ants are carried home by their companions and the dead are buried in a regular ant cemetery the boys had listened with a fascinated interest to these marvelous stories of life going on all around them and to which they had never given more than a passing thought well said jim it sure is the queerest thing i ever heard about if anyone else but dick had told me this i wouldn't have believed it yes said tom it certainly sounds like a fairy story what gets me said shorty is that the queen seems to be the most important of the whole bunch what about the king it must be a regular suffragette colony yes replied dick in a certain sense it is the males of the community don't amount to much one by one their privileges are taken away from them they even lose their wings before the females do after they have taken their flight and safely escorted the queen to her future home they drop out of sight their wings fall off and in some cases are pulled off by the more ill-tempered females of the family they hang around a little while and then drop out of sight altogether nobody seems to care what becomes of them they can't even get back to the place from which they started their wings are gone and they can't walk they remind me of the cat they are so different the cat came back the male ants can't gee said jim how do the rest get on without them oh replied dick they don't seem to mind the males at all it takes away some of the conceit of the male sex when they see how easily one can get along without them well said shorty who is never partial to work they at least get rid of a lot of trouble how about the carpenter ants the soldier ants the foraging ants are they all females every one of them said dick it is a regular colony of amazons it seems to me said shorty that in all the bunch the queen is the only one who has a snap don't you believe it returned dick as a matter of fact she is the hardest worker of all that is at the start she is the busiest kind of a mother brings up all the little ants washes their faces combing their hair oh say interrupted shorty aren't you putting it a little bit too strong dick not at all said dick here take up this ant and look at it through the magnifying glass under the lens the boys crowding around saw that there sure enough was a fine silky down resembling very much the hair upon the human head of course said dick as in every other part of the animal or insect world this only lasts for a little while men and women are the only creatures in the whole universe that stick by their children through thick and thin there is no better mother than a cat for instance while the kittens are small and they need her help but just as soon as they are able to shift for themselves nothing more doing for mrs cat out they go to hustle for their own living and if some of the slower and lazier ones still hang around the mother's claws soon give them a sharp reminder that it is time to be up and doing the same is true of the birds see how the mother bird sits brooding over her eggs with what tender care she watches them while they are still unable to feed themselves how the father bird scratches from morning to night to find worms to put down those scrawny little beaks but after a while they too go to the edge of the nest and with many a timid flutter stretch their wings and drop off the edge and with the laggards the parental beak is ready to push them off into the new world where they hustle for themselves it is only a fellow's father and mother that stand by him to the end 
no matter how bad he is how often he wretches their hearts how many times he has sinned and been forgiven and sinned again the mother heart clings to him to the end i tell you what boys you can't make too much of that father and mother of yours you bet came in a responsive murmur from the boys now going back to the queen said dick it sure does seem that after the kids have grown up she'd have a dandy time she is by far the biggest figure in the colony the worker ants can't do too much for her she has the finest room and the choicest food and yet after all i suppose this becomes tiresome it is just as it is with human queens so many things are done for them so much pomp and ceremony surrounds them that no doubt they often sigh for freedom and would exchange their places with almost any of their subjects they are something like a little girl that was a rich man's daughter her milk was pasteurized the water she drank was sterilized so that after a while her only thought was to grow big enough to do as she chose and the very first thing she was going to do was eat a germ the boys laughed and dick resumed it is almost pathetic to see the poor old queen going out for a walk she moves in a perfect circle of courtiers as long as she keeps in the middle she is all right but the minute she strays to one side or attempts to go further this surrounding group push her back sometimes they thrust their shoulders against her and at other times simply mass themselves in front of her and even at times are undignified enough if these hints are not sufficient to take her by one of her antenna and lead her back into the centre of the circle for all the world like a mother taking home a naughty child by the ear no you can bet it is not all peaches and cream where the queen is concerned well said shorty only partly convinced even if the queen has troubles of her own it must be nice to be the aristocrat think of having nothing to do but just hang around and let the carpenter ants build your house and the farmer ants store up the grain and the foraging ants bring in the caterpillars and the soldier ants do the fighting no said dick you are wrong again shorty they do so little and become so dependent upon the work of others that after a while they seem to lose their faculties they wander around in a crazy and feeble way trying to kill time i suppose and after a while become so lazy and helpless that they can't even eat without help can't eat said jim whose appetite was a standing joke in camp then no lords and dukes for me i really think resumed dick that just as it is in human life the workers are the lucky ones after all there is something doing every minute their lives are full of interest they are too busy to be unhappy don't make any mistake fellows work is the salvation of the world the happiest are the busiest the drones and sluggards are almost without exception the most miserable creatures on the face of the earth if i were but just at this moment a curious thing happened the afternoon had worn on while the boys were talking and so keen was their interest in the wonders that were being brought before their eyes that they had failed to realize how late it was the ants had been wandering around in an aimless way that is it seemed aimless to the boys but doubtless they knew what they were about and had a definite object even though the boys couldn't understand it but now a sudden stir and bustle seemed to arouse the colony from numerous gates the throng came forth with almost military order and precision ah said dick here's just the thing you want to see boys it is milking time and the ants are going to herd their cows now we will follow one of these lines and see just how they do it at a few feet distant from the mound there was a little shrub about three feet high covered with foliage and with widely extended branches the column of ants reached the foot of this climbed it and scattered among the branches 
the boys at a signal from dick followed him softly so that the ants might not be disturbed see said dick gently taking hold of a branch that projected beyond the others look through this magnifying glass one by one the boys stole up each eager for a sight that they had never before seen or dreamed of on the upper side of the branch which dick held between his thumb and finger were little groups of parasites almost too small to be seen by the naked eye all day long they had been feeding upon the sap that came from a branch until their bodies were swollen with a transparent honeydew an ant approached one of them placed its antenna over the throat and extracted a tiny drop of the colorless liquid again and again this was repeated it seemed like rank robbery but there was no resistance on the part of the herd they seemed just as glad that milking time had come as do the cows that stand lowing at the bars of the fence and calling for the farmer drop after drop of the honey-dew was extracted until finally the aphid as the little creature is called grew lank and thin while the ant became correspondingly large from time to time the antenna of the ant stroked the tiny hair on the back just as a farmer would stroke the cow in order to soothe it and keep it perfectly still finally the milking was completed and the farmer ants retraced their way along the branch and down the stem and falling into line with their comrades similarly laden resumed their march to the colony the boys had watched with bated breath and almost awe-struck interest well said jim at last breaking the silence those ants are surely not going hungry to bed gee said shorty i bet they will suffer from indigestion not a bit of it said dick you don't suppose they keep this to themselves do you just look here he lifted a stone about eighteen inches from the foot of the mound under the magnifying glass they could see a number of tiny apertures that evidently led in the direction of the colony and on one side an ant waiting for the return of the milking party as dick selected one and placed his magnifying glass directly upon the opening the boys could see one of the ants laden with the honeydew stop and placing its mouth close to that of the waiting ant exude a tiny drop of its burden moving the glass around quickly in the arc of a circle they saw this process repeated until finally the round was finished and the farmer ants more lightly laden than before went on toward the main entrance of the colony those said dick are the lords and dukes getting their supper well said tom after this i am ready to believe anything i tell you what dick i never learned so much in my life as i have to-day yes said shorty as the boys picked up their kits and prepared to return to camp i am glad enough now that i didn't smash that ant nest when i tried to after all they are good sports and i would hate to spoil their fun yes replied dick you know that one of the most important principles in life is kindness to anything that breathes of course there are certain pests that are harmful to human life and we are compelled to kill in self-defense but for anything that is harmless the one great principle that should govern us always is found in those two lines that mr hollis repeated the other day never to blend our pleasure or our pride with sorrow to the meanest thing that feels end of chapter seven Chapter 8 of Bert Wilson at the Wheel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Bert Wilson at the Wheel by J. W. Duffield. Chapter 8 The Gypsy Caravan. Hello, fellows, look at this. Well, of all the... 
the boys looked up at bob's startled exclamation and for a moment everything else was forgotten while they stared with wide open eyes at the grotesque procession that came into view down the road crawled a little caravan of ten or a dozen ramshackle wagons drawn by tired-looking horses at their heads or alongside walked a number of men of various ages dressed in all sorts of nondescript costumes their swarthy faces and dark eyes together with the large earrings that they wore gave them a distinctly piratical appearance and to the boys they looked as though they might have been taken bodily from one of the old romances of the spanish main they might easily have been the blood brothers of the rascals who sang in thundering chorus fifteen men on a dead man's chest sing high ho and a bottle of rum but alas there were no murderous pistols thrust in their belts or cutlasses held between their teeth to complete the illusion and the picturesque crowd resolved itself into a troop of gypsies going into camp the place they had pitched upon for their temporary stay was about three miles distant from the boys camp and had been chosen with a keen eye to its advantages either through a scout sent ahead or simply by that marvellous sixth sense so highly developed in wandering peoples they had elected to stop at a little ravine through which ran a brook of sparkling water and surrounded by a wood that furnished ample supplies for their campfires it was fascinating to see their dexterity born of long experience with which the camp was pitched the horses were unhitched in a twinkling and turned out to graze while the wagons were ranged in a single circle around the camp some brown dirty canvas and a few branches of trees were quickly transformed into tents wood was cut a rough fireplace built a huge kettle suspended over the flames that crackled merrily beneath and the women and girls who had descended from the wagons busied themselves in bringing water from the brook and preparing supper for the tired and hungry crew the men after the rougher work was done sprawled around upon the grass talking in a language unintelligible to the boys and occasionally casting an indifferent look at the group in the automobile who had watched the scene with breathless interest well said bert at last as he roused himself with an effort they haven't asked us to stay to supper and i suppose it isn't good manners to hang around while they are eating even if this is a public place so here goes and throwing in the clutch he started the red scout off towards camp the liveliest interest not unmixed with envy was shown by the other boys at the recital by the auto squad of the afternoon's adventure gee said jim dawson you fellows certainly do have all the luck if i'd been with you there'd have been nothing more exciting than a rabbit scurrying across the road today i stayed behind and here you fellows have watched the pitching of a gypsy camp never mind jim said tom we'll all go over soon and take it in i suppose they'll be there for some time there's no telling remarked dick sometimes they stay in one place for two or three weeks until the call of the road becomes so strong that they can't resist it then again after a day or two they fold their tents like the arabs and silently steal away steal is a very good word to use in that connection dick said mr hollis as he joined the group when after an abundant supper they sat around the campfire, for if what we hear of gypsies in general is true they spend most of their time in stealing perhaps though he went on that is putting it a little too harshly there is a strong prejudice against them because of their vagrant mode of life and there is no doubt that the distinction between mine and thine is very vague in their minds hen roosts are apt to be mysteriously thinned out when they are in the neighborhood and many a porker has uttered his last squeal when gripped by a gypsy hand horses too occasionally vanish in a way that would mean a short shrift and a rope in the western country if the thief were caught but on the other hand they seldom commit deeds of violence you never hear of their blowing open a safe and though they are passionate and hot-tempered they are not often charged with murder the bowery thug and yeggmen are much more dangerous enemies to society than the average gypsy perhaps the worst indictment to be brought against them is that in years past they were frequently guilty of kidnapping 
but that was in the earlier days when the country was sparsely settled and communication was difficult then if they got a good start it was often impossible to overtake them but today, with the country thickly populated and the telegraph and telephone everywhere, they would most certainly be caught. No doubt the elders of the tribe shake their heads sadly as they reflect that the kidnapping industry is no longer what it has been. How do they make a living, anyway? interjected Dave. What they steal isn't enough to keep them alive. Well, returned Mr. Hollis, the men are very keen traders in horses. They know a horse from mane to hoof. They can take a poor old wreck of a cart horse and doctor him up until he looks and acts like a thoroughbred. Very few men can get ahead of them in a trade, as many a farmer has found to his cost. The women are often very expert in embroidery and find a ready sale for their really beautiful work. Then, too, as fortune-tellers, they are proverbial the world over. Cross a gypsy's palm with gold or silver, and she'll predict for you a future that kings and queens might envy. It is safe to say that during their stay here they will reap quite a harvest, enough at least to suffice for the simple needs of today. As for tomorrow, they don't care. That can take care of itself. They are as irresponsible as crickets or butterflies. They never trouble, trouble, till trouble troubles them." Well, said Dave, they get rid of a whole lot of needless worry, anyway. They don't suffer as much as the old lady did who said that she had had an awful lot of trouble in her life and most of it had never happened. The boys laughed and Tom asked, Where do you get their name from? Why do they call them gypsies? Because, answered Mr. Hollis, they were supposed to be descended from old Egyptians. They resemble them in features, and many words in their language are derived from Egypt. Many scholars think, however, that their original home was India. Europe has been familiar with them for the last four hundred years. They have always been Ishmaelites, their hand against every man and every man's hand against them, and by some they have been believed to be the actual descendants of Ishmael, the outcast son of Abraham. Everywhere they have been despised and persecuted. In the old days they were accused of being sorcerers and witches. They have been banished, burned at the stake, broken on the wheel, hung, drawn, and quartered. It is one of the miracles of history that they have not been wiped out altogether. But they have always clung closely together and persisted in their strange, wandering way of life. They have a language of their own and certain rude laws that all the tribes acknowledge. The restless instinct is in their blood and probably will be there forever. They are a living protest against civilization as we understand it. Occasionally, one of them will join the ranks of ordinary men, but far more frequently they gain recruits from those who want to throw off the shackles and conventions of the settled life. More than one man and woman have listened to the call of the wild and followed the gypsies, as the children in the fable followed the Pied Piper of Hamelin. But now, boys, he said, rising, it's time for taps. Tomorrow evening we'll all go over and take a closer look at these gypsies of yours. All through the following day, the boys, though attentive to what they were doing, were keenly alive to the promised treat that night. There was an early supper to which, despite the undercurrent of excitement, they did full justice, and then in the gathering dusk the boys set out for the grove. Since not all could go in the automobile, it was decided that all should go on foot, and with jest and laughter they covered the three miles almost before they knew it. Quite different from that of the day before was the sight that burst upon them as they rounded a curve in the road and came upon the picturesque vagrants. Here and there were torches of pitch pine that threw a smoky splendor over the scene and hid all the squalor and sordid poverty that had been so evident in the broad light of day. By this time it was fully dark, but a full moon cast its beauty over the trees and flecked the ground with bright patches that, added to the torches, made the whole grove like a fairyland. The news of the gypsies' coming had reached the surrounding towns, and there was quite a gathering of pretty girls and country swains whose buggies stood under the trees at the roadside, while youths and maidens wandered among the wagons of the caravan. At the open door of one of the vans, a young gypsy drew from a violin, 
the weird heart-tugging strains that have made their music famous throughout the world others sat around their fire and talked together in a low tone casting furtive glances at the visitors whose coming they seemed neither to welcome nor resent with their instinctive appreciation of the fine points in any animal the eyes of some of them brightened as don the collie threaded his way through the different groups but apart from that they gave no sign that they were conscious of the newcomers with the gypsy women however it was different this was their hour and they improved it to the utmost withered crones and handsome girls with curious turbans wound round their heads went from group to group offering to tell their fortunes provided their palms were crossed there was no difficulty about this as most of the girls had come there with that one desire and the gallant youths who escorted them urged them to gratify it regardless of expense if the recording angel put down that night all the lies that were told all the promises of wealth and title and position that sent many a giddy head a whirl to its pillow he was kept exceedingly busy just for a lark the boys themselves were willing patrons of these priestesses of the future but little of what was promised them remained in their memory except that tom was to meet a dark lady who was to have a great and happy influence upon his life the boys chafed him a good deal about this mystical brunette but he maintained with mock gravity that one never knows and that perhaps the swarthy soothsayer knew what she was talking about after all in view of the unusual circumstances mr hollis had not insisted upon the ordinary rules and it was nearly midnight when the boys having trudged back to camp prepared to retire what time is it anyway dick yawned bert as they started to undress i'll see said dick as he reached for his watch it's just he stopped aghast as the chain came out of his pocket with a jerk his watch was gone at this instant a shout came from bob ward's tent say fellas have any of you seen my scarf pin i can't find it anywhere i'm sure i had it on when i started bert looked at dick and dick stared back at bert the same thought came into their minds at once stung groaned dick as he sat down heavily on his bed at once the camp was in commotion everyone made a hasty inventory of his belongings and the relief was general when it was found that nothing else was missing their hearts were hot with indignation however at the loss of their comrades dick's gold watch had been a graduation present and bob's scarf pin had held a handsome stone so that the money loss was considerable but deeper yet was the sense of chagrin voiced by jim dawson well said he disgustedly if this isn't the limit here we are city fellows who think we are up to snuff we are surrounded by pickpockets every day and nothing happens then we come out in the country and are roasted brown by a band of wandering gypsies by this time mr hollis aroused by the unusual stir had hastily dressed and joined the excited group the facts were quickly detailed to him and as he listened his face set in hard lines that boded ill for the thieves he first directed that a thorough search be made in order to be perfectly sure that the missing articles were not somewhere about the camp when careful examination failed to reveal them doubts became certainty if only one thing had been lost it might have been set down to carelessness or accident but that two should disappear at the same time pointed to but one explanation theft and it was a foregone conclusion that the thieves were to be found in the gypsy camp the more hot-headed were for starting out at once to regain the watch and pin at any cost but this was vetoed by mr hollis who recognized the futility of attempting anything at so late an hour he promised that early in the morning they should all go together and with that promise they were forced to be content there was very little sleep for the boys that night and at the first streak of dawn the whole camp was astir breakfast was swallowed hastily and bert whistled for don as the boys made ready to start here don old fellow good dog he called when the whistle failed to bring him but no don appeared then a thought suddenly struck bert when had he last seen the collie in the excitement last night he and the other boys had given no thought to the dog he recalled with a sudden sick feeling that he had last seen him in the light of the gypsy torches 
his heart smote him for his forgetfulness was it possible that the gypsies had stolen don also why not he never would have stayed away of his own accord the collie was a splendid animal of the purest breed and would easily bring a large price if offered for sale anywhere a fierce rage flamed in bert a rage shared by all the others when he hastily told them of the suspicion that every moment was becoming a conviction and it was lucky for the abductor of don that he did not at that moment meet bert wilson face to face with dick tom and bob he leaped into the red scout and taking up mr hollis as they came to the door of his tent they swung into the broad high road leaving the others to follow as fast as they could now purr old scout said bert as he threw in the clutch and the red scout purred it leaped forward like a living thing as though it pulsed with the indignation and determination of its riders they fairly ate up the three miles in as many minutes turned the curve of the road just this side of the gypsy camp and <gasps> the camp was gone gone as though it had dropped into the earth gone as though it had melted into the air utterly and completely gone the ashes of last night's fires some litter scattered here and there alone remained to mark the spot that a few hours before had been so full of life and animation they leaped from the car and scattered everywhere looking for signs to indicate the direction the caravan had taken they had certainly not come south by the boys camp it was equally certain that they had not gone directly north, as this led straight to a large town that they would instinctively avoid. This narrowed the search to east and west roads, from which, however, many by-roads diverged, so that it left them utterly at sea. "'The telephone!' cried Bert. "'Let's try that first. They bundled into the car, and a few minutes brought them to the nearest town. Picking out half a dozen addresses along different roads, they called them up. Had they seen a band of gypsies going by? The answer, no, came with exasperating monotony, until suddenly Bert leaped to his feet. Here we are, boys, he cried. Bartlett on the Ashley Road, eight miles from here. Saw them go by two hours ago. Now let's get busy. They flew down the Ashby Road, and in a few minutes came to the Bartlett farm. Yes, they had passed there, and they certainly were traveling some. A couple of miles further on, the road forked. There was a negro cabin at that place, and they might get some information there. He hoped so, anyway. Good luck, and with a word of thanks, the boys rushed on. A stout negress, washing clothes under the tree at the fork of the road, wiped the suds from her hands with her apron as she came forward. They surely did pass ye, gentlemen, and they was driving as though the dear old Nick was after him. That's a powerful poor road up that ways, and their horses was plumb tired. They can't be very far ahead, I specs. Exulting, Bart threw in the high speed. Their quarry had been run down at last. The motor fairly sang as they plunged up the road. Turning a curve to the right, they came upon a procession of carts now toiling along painfully. Bert never hesitated a second, but rushed past the line of wagons until he had reached the head of the caravan. Then he swung the Red Scout squarely across the road, and with Mr. Hollis, Dick, Tom, and Bob sprang to the ground. Consternation plainly reigned in the halted carts. The men crowded forward and hastily consulted. A moment later, an old man, evidently the chief, came forward. He was prepared to try diplomacy first, and with an ingratiating smile held out his hand to Mr. Hollis. The latter, ignoring the extended hand, came straight to the point. "'I want three things,' he said, "'and unless you are looking for trouble, you'll hand them over at once. I want the pin and the watch and the dog you people stole from us last night.' The leader's smile faded, to be replaced by an ominous scowl. "'It's a lie,' he said sullenly. "'My people stole nothing. Get out of our road,' he snarled viciously, while his followers gathered threateningly around him. The air was surcharged with danger, and a fight seemed imminent, when suddenly a familiar bark came from one of the vans. Bert dashed forward, thrusting aside a young gypsy who sprang to intercept him. He threw open the van door, and out rushed Don, mad with delight. He had chewed in half the rope that held him, and the frayed remnant hung about his neck as he leaped on Bert and capered frantically about him. The game was up. 
fear and chagrin were painted on the gypsies faces they might have bluffed through as regards the stolen articles and it would have been almost impossible to prove their guilt but here was the living proof of theft proof strong enough to land their party behind the bars moreover the great dog was no mean addition to the little force that faced them so undauntedly it was plainly up to them to temporize as bob with regrettable slanginess but crisp brevity summed up the case they had thought to make a quick touch and get away but fell down doing it the chief held up his hand wait he said while i talk to my people perhaps they have found something i will see a whispered conversation followed and then he came forward sheepishly holding out the watch and pen they found them on the grounds i did not know he mumbled mr hollis took them without a word and motioned bert to get the auto ready he had gained his point and did not care to press his advantage further after all they were almost like irresponsible children and despite his resentment he felt a deep pity for these half-wild sons of poverty and misfortune their code was not his code nor their laws his laws they were the underdogs in the fight of life let them go the motor began to hum the party piled in with don between them barking joyfully and they swept down the shabby line of carts with not a glance behind them they waved gaily to the old black mammy who beamed upon them as they went by a thought struck bert and turning to tom he shouted the dark lady tom the dark lady that the gypsy prophesied would bring you luck sure thing grinned tom it certainly is luck enough to get old don back to say nothing of the watch and pin isn't it old fellow and he patted the dog's head lovingly so thought the rest of the boys also when the red scout reached camp don was overwhelmed with caresses and strutted about as though he had done it all as jim put it napoleon on his return from elba had nothing on don it was late when the excitement subsided and the campers went weary but happy to bed mr hollis bert and dick lingered about the fire only these older ones had realized how ticklish a situation they had faced that day they didn't like to think what might have happened if it had come to an open fight the way you faced that crowd was the pluckiest thing i ever saw mr hollis said bert but suppose it had come to a showdown well laughed mr hollis it was a case of touch and go for a minute but i counted on the fact that we were right and they were wrong conscience makes cowards of us all behind us were law and order and civilization behind them crowded nameless shapes of fear and dread that robbed their arms of strength and turned their hearts to water it was simply a confirmation he concluded as he rose to say good night of the eternal truth thrice is he armed that hath his quarrel just end of chapter eight the gypsy caravan